Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, this is a very great moment to share with the, the Miami team uh, this moment, this webinar. Unfortunately, we would like to have him here in Morocco in person, but uh, you know the circumstances, uh, things are playing out now. So as an, an introduction, uh, I would like to say that uh, urologists at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century dealt with what was commonly known at that time as prostate enlargement in, it, in its complication with either a straightforward manner and that was a prostatectomy or indirectly by either castration or devascularization of the gland. <clears throat> this is usually by analogy to uterine fibroid was done by ligating both internal iliac arteries and the procedure was in itself very invasive and resulted in severe complication and sometimes a higher rate of lethality. With the advent of modern uh, interventional radiologists, the procedure was revisited and refined by super selectively targeting the prostate artery with, without compromising the blood supply to neighboring organs. The involvement of ER or interventional radiology in dealing with prostate disorder may be in some uh, regarded by some urology community as an, an invasion of their territory. But instead, we should regard this open-mindedly as a valuable addition to our therapeutic armamentarium. The right attitude toward this paradigm shift is not resist change, but rather embrace it. For this purpose, and in that spirit, we invited two of the best brain and hands that took over this topic and put that's in picture with regard to the state of art of the indication procedure and the result of prostate artery embolization and BPH and its complications. Let me first introduce both of them, Dr. Shivank Bhatia, who is a, a board certified interventional radiologist at U Health University of Miami Health System. He's an associate professor of interventional radiology and the urology and is a chairman of the Department of Interventional Radiology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He is he's a, a multidisciplinary team of, of clinical experts in research. He earned his medical degree of BG Medical College in Ahmedabad, India, and he pioneered prostate artery embolization in US, and he trained more than 300 physicians on the technique related to prostate artery embolization. He had a dual clinical appointment in the interventional radiology and urology. He's an expert in minimally invasive image-guided procedures to treat enlarged prostate and uterine fibroid and liver cancer. So I tried to summarize because it's very, very long resume and with a lot of achievements. Yeah, my mistake. <laughs> Second is Dr. Isam Kavli. He's a, a board certified associate professor of interventional radiology and medical director of interventional radiology. He was trained both in France and US with uh, expertise in minimally invasive procedure. He provided interventional radiology procedure for the last 12 years at the Jackson Memorial Hospital, where he served as an associate medical director of the IR, and where he pioneered men's health intervention and the percutaneous spine, and, uh, spine intervention of, in cancer. He delivered multiple lectures and scientific presentation and published scientific articles in peer-reviewed journal on the topic of interventional radiology. He, his clinical interests focus on endovascular and percutaneous treatment of the prostate disease. Uh, both, welcome both of you guys. That's a very excellent achievement. I, I can't really read through all your achievement, but it, it, it looks very impressive and uh, uh, it belies your very good expertise in this subject. Uh, before starting, I, well, I want to extend my thanks to uh, Cooper Pharma for sponsoring this event and for providing the platform to make this uh, event happen. So without delaying any further, I will just hand, hand over the mic to Dr. Batya to start with the indication and the procedure of the PAI. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, thank you team, thank you Copper Pharma, thank you my colleague, uh, Dr. Kabli, 
who actually is from Morocco, which I always say it's Morocco's loss our gain. You know, he's such a skilled uh, person, physician, and a colleague that we are very, very honored to have him um, working with us. So uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to <clears throat> go over like more of an overview uh, of, uh, you know, prostate artery embolization and uh, some of the clinical outcomes as well. So this uh, procedure, I got interested personally in 2012. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, it was really only few procedures, a few cases done out of Brazil and Portugal. Um, it's actually one of the pioneers of intervention radiology, Dr. Pisco. Um, as per my understanding, he started doing this when unfortunately his brother had a severe complication from a TURP procedure. And he was already a pioneer in uterine fibroid embolization at that point of time. And he went on to do over, you know, over 1000 prostate embolization procedures. And unfortunately he passed away a couple of years back uh, at Society of Intervention Radiology meetings. So first of all, I want to uh, tribute to him, you know, for introducing this to the world and Dr. Carnivali from Brazil, who is also a dear friend. Um, we got involved in around 2014. Now we have uh, treated over 800 men with this procedure, one of the largest experience in United States and, and pretty much second largest in the world at this point. So again, it's, it's an honor for us. It's, uh, we, we are really blessed to be uh, in this particular uh, area and role to be able to help so many people. So I'm going to share my screen. Is everyone able to see the screen? Perfect, yes. Perfect. All right, so I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm talking to a group of urologists, so obviously I'm going to be very uh, cognizant of that fact and I'm not going to discuss all the basics of uh, uh, LUTs and BPH and the patient workup and the Euroflow and the Eurodynamics and all those things because you know that 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 that's not right. <laughs> you know me me discussing all those things with you guys. So I'm I'm just really going to focus on on prostate artery embolization for for BPH. So what's the rationale? You know why embolization uh, for an enlarged prostate? <clears throat> so you know we we delved into uterine fibroid embolization around 1996. And by 2004, it was FDA approved. And then, you know, now it's considered to be a standard of care. So why did it take us such a long time as an intervention radiology community to figure out that what we have done in fibroid space, we can do in prostate space as well? <clears throat> I think the answer lies in the anatomy and in next few slides that this is a technically very, very challenging uh, procedure. And to be able to perform a safe embolization without affecting the surrounding organs like bladder, rectum, a penis, I think is the key. Uh, so definitely the procedure involves, uh, you know, I won't say significant risk after the experience we have, but, you know, significant learning curve. So what's the rationale? Why embolization? So BPH per se, it's, it's a hypervascular condition, though it's not malignant, obviously, as we know. And with embolization, we aim to cause ischemia which has a, a triple action. One is reduction in the size of the prostate, reduction in the consistency of the prostate. As we know that, you know, the hyper, uh, as the hyperplasia develops, there is uh, well-defined the nodules which develop in the transition zone and those nodules have a stromal component. Uh, so they are pretty hard uh, as well as, you know, they are hypervascular. And the third effect is reduction of the hormonal action. So the effect leads to urethral decompression, decrease in the smooth muscle tone and reduction or altered disease progression with improvement of urinary flow and symptoms and quality of life. <clears throat> so around 2007, there were two or three uh, animal studies which were performed of uh, feasibility and safety of prostate artery embolization in dogs. And a consistent outcome was 40% reduction in uh, prostate size on CT scan and it was well correlated on pathology and, and imaging without any major non-target uh, side effects in the bladder, rectum, uh, and other organs. First intentional clinical use, 2010, in two patients, um, and then those were followed up in 2011, and that was our first exposure uh, to this particular procedure. 
So diving right into what makes this procedure challenging, I'll, I'll go over like, you know, the basics of prostate arterial anatomy. Uh, so we understand, you know, what it takes really to perform this embolization in a safe fashion. So this is uh, a, an, an angiographic image of pelvis and it's an ipsilateral oblique image. Uh, <clears throat> so we are looking at from an oblique perspective. And uh, in this particular case, um, I'm going to show in a second, but Every time we do this, uh, we have the anterior division and the posterior division of the internal iliac. And we, we always identify the three vessels, obturator artery, internal pudendal artery, and inferior gluteal artery. And in this particular case, the prostatic artery is arising right there from an inferior vesicle origin with the, with the green uh, mark on it. But the other potential origins are arising from the anterior division or the gluteal pudendal trunk or the internal pudendal. These two combined are 50% of the origins. Inferior vesicle is 25%. Obturator is another 15%. And then there are some other rare origins. So these are the, the common origins which we deal with on day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> but also it's important to understand in terms of the vasculature from our perspective, from an embolization perspective, that there are urethral branches or the BPH zone or the transition zone branches. And then there are capsular branches which <clears throat> are supplying the peripheral zone. And some of these pass on to rectum and anal canal. So this is like a, a picture image, but on the angiographic image, it's a very nice correlation of the hypervascular flow uh, to the transitional zone. And then that's the peripheral zone flow. So some more ideas about the identification. We start with you know, 30 degrees, ipsilateral oblique. We use Foley catheter. We used to use Foley catheter. Now with experience, we no longer have to use Foley catheter. It arises from anterior division. It's almost never a first branch of internal iliac. It has a tortuous S-shaped course towards midline and almost inevitably it crosses the obturator, uh, which is when we call it as a crop sign, a crossing obturator sign or if it's an IPA origin, it will cross the femoral head on an oblique image. We do see corkscrew vessels uh, supplying the hypervascular uh, uh, BPH nodules in the transition zone or the median lobe. And that's another way we identify which branch is actually supplying the prostate. Around 80 to 85%, it's a single artery on each side. Another 10 to 15% is dual prostatic artery so then which means there are two different arteries supplying the transition zone uh, another example of uh, prostatic origin so these are the branches to bladder the orange one branch to prostate rectum and ipa and uh, we always see this pattern which obviously makes anatomical sense that there's ipsilateral oblique so we'll see bladder followed by prostate followed by rectal followed by internal pudendal artery so this is an inferior vesicle origin example. Again, the incidence remains around 25% in our experience. <clears throat> the second one is uh, internal pudendal origin. In this case, again, the bladder origin first or bladder branch first, second is prostate, third is rectal, and then fourth is IPA. So selective injection, this is what we like to see in hypervascular um, a blush within the prostate or the left hemiprostate. And we can confirm this on what we call as a cone beam CT, which means we are able to perform a CT scan during the procedure after putting a micro catheter or small tiny catheter into the prostate. And we inject some contrast and we do a CT scan, which actually shows that, okay, we are supplying only the prostate and nothing else. So internal pudendal origin incidence is around 50%. And the third one is the obturator origin. In this case, again, the green one, and um, this origin is around 15%. So it's very important for us to selectively use like, you know, very tiny micro catheters and get into this. In fact, me and Isam have worked with, you know, a lot of uh, companies to design specific like smaller catheters, which are used towards uh, specifically prostate uh, embolization. Anatomical variants, I think are very important, but I'm going to breeze through this. Um, but just to show that you know, why the technically the procedure can be challenging. This is what we call as a corona mortis or an empty pelvis sign where there is no obturator artery on the internal iliac injection. <clears throat> and the obturator is coming from external iliac and the prostate actually comes from obturator artery coming from external iliac. 
which I think is important, you know, in cases of trauma, but also in sometimes in cases of when performing prostatectomy, and obviously all of you are aware of this variation uh, coming from external iliac artery as well. <clears throat> so accessory obturator is applying like, you know, uh, known as corona mortis. The other, variation, other variant is uh, terminal internal pudendal supplying uh, the prosthetic. Uh, rare, I've seen like three or four percent of uh, cases, but again, something which we uh, we would not want to miss, and uh, specifically in, in smokers. So this is the critical part uh, in terms of uh, uh, potential anastomosis and potential non-target embolization risk. The risk is to the bladder, blood flow, penile, and rectum. Uh, in fact, the major risk remains really only for penile. The bladder and rectum are pretty safe. Uh, the only way you can or anyone can cause com complications related to bladder and rectum is if you are selectively into those branches and you embolize those two stasis. But, you know, few small particles into bladder or rectum blood supply does not cause any clinical consequence except some small amount of blood in uh, urine or in stool. But penile is the major one. We have seen around, we have performed over 800 of these procedures and we have seen I would say like five or six times uh, non-target embolization <clears throat> to the penis, and all of them have healed uh, completely by just using topical therapy. So the first example, again, the prosthetic artery, uh, in this case is right there, but there is a big branch supplying the bladder. So our goal is really to position the catheter distal uh, to the bladder branch origin. And if we are not able to do that, we use a very small a coil, usually around two millimeter coil to protect the bladder flow. Same thing with the uh, penile. We like to make sure obviously that there is no non-target or embolization or particles going down to the penile supply. And uh, especially in the accessory pudendal origin. And uh, you can see on cone beam CT, it's a very, very impressive, the blood flow to the penis coming from the prosthetic artery. And in this case, <clears throat> we, uh, place a coil uh, just in the mid prosthetic artery distal to all the actual branches to protect the flow or, or protect like any kind of uh, particles going down to the penis. Penis has accessory pudendal as well as internal pudendal as well as the other side accessory and internal pudendal. So we have done a study when whenever we have done this coil embolization, it has not led to any kind of uh, erectile dysfunction later. Uh, to rectum, as I mentioned, it's it's more common, especially you know from the peripheral zone branch, <clears throat> but it's uh, it's it's safe really um, as long as we are avoiding uh, the the major rectal supply. So if this is really the the prostatic artery, just in a line diagram, the yellow one, and all the interprostatic branches, whenever we see communication to penis, either through the going through the gland or through accessory pudendal, we prefer to coil those for 100% of cases. When it comes to rectum or to bladder, uh, if only if we see a significant risk, then we will use coils, uh, very small coils to pr protect those branches. Now, this is an, an animation which shows uh, how the procedure works. We put a small catheter through the groin or through the wrist. We actually do 95% of procedures through the wrist. And then we thread this small microcatheter go all the way selective into the prosthetic blood flow. And once we see we are in a good position, then we inject these small spheres, which are essentially made up <clears throat> of uh, polymer coated with gelatin. Uh, the part, the, these, part, these particles always stay within the prostate. They do not move. They have a positive charge on it. Our blood vessels have a negative charge. So they are uh, embedded in the prosthetic blood uh, vessels uh, for uh, forever. <clears throat> so once we are selectively there, we inject these small particles and we want to make sure that we are not doing it too fast. So usually we inject, you know, one to two, two cc of uh, mixture uh, every minute. So it takes around 10 to 15 minutes to perform just the embolization. And uh, the way the particles comes, we, we dilute them with 10 cc of saline and 10 cc of contrast. This is a good important concept about the perfected technique that once we get complete stasis, there is no more forward flow. Sometimes uh, there is still distal flow, we are just not able to see it. So we advance the catheter uh, distally into 
uh, into the gland and we are able to inject even more particles. As you can see in this animation in the video, coming in, the particle, the catheter going now more distal. So we are injecting some more, couple of cc more there. And then we pull the catheter back <clears throat> and we inject more particles on our way out. <clears throat> so these are like, we are talking about thousands and thousands of particles. Uh, and the diameter of these particles are somewhere between 100 to 500 microns, which is essentially diameter of the hair. If we were to cut our hair and then you know cross section it, <clears throat> so we we usually inject around you know one cc per or ten cc of the size of the gland, and if it's a hundred cc gland, we will end up injecting around ten cc on each side, and then we confirm this on cone beam CT at the end uh, to make sure that we have very good distribution of the particles into the prostate. So as I mentioned, you know, most of these procedures we perform through radial access through the wrist approach. The procedure is an outpatient procedure done under conscious sedation. It takes around, you know, 1.5 to three hours. I think this slide is two years old. Now all the cases are under, under one hour. <clears throat> wrist or groin access, x-ray guidance. Um, our technical success rate, which we label as bilateral embolization is more than 98%. No Foley catheter is used anymore for these procedures, unless patient has a history of a very high post-void residual or recurrent uh, UTIs or recent history of urinary retention. Uh, it's been just <clears throat> so I'm going to show this video quickly, just so that you know we we go over how the recovery is after the procedure. Three to seven days of burning, urgency, bladder spasms, mild to moderate pain, controlled by medication mild blood in stool or urine, we encourage normal fluid intake. Uh, it's been just two weeks since uh, my procedure, and I can tell you I am a different person now. Uh, the first, I, actually, I got on a plane and on Friday, just 10 days afterwards. I didn't have to get up off my seat on a three-plus-hour flight. It was great. Anyway, basically, you really prepared me well. The uh, first five days, yeah, you had the cramping that started to go away. The burning was probably the last thing that stayed. And by seven days, I was already, I felt the change. After 10 days, the change was even more rapid. And I feel like, like I said, I'm, it's a, I'm a new person. Uh, my definition of urinating was stop, dribble, stop, start, all kinds of random, all kinds of a few hours in the middle of the night. Now, it just start and stop, and I'm done for the night. It's great. And from what you said, the best is yet to come in a couple of months. But what a change. I feel I'm in New York visiting. I just had a grandchild. I'm walking the streets. I don't have to run into any bathroom. Well, anyway, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful. And thank you for you and your team for making me. So this is how most of our patients do, especially the one with the larger glands. Uh, you know, more than 90% of patients have this kind of experience. <clears throat> when it comes to complications, no need for urinary catheter, no need for any CBI, obviously, no hospitalization, no transfusions, no antiplatelet, no worrying, worrying about like uh, taking people off antiplatelet. Going through wrist, we are able to treat patients on anticoagulation. No risk of retrograde ejaculation, no erectile dysfunction, no incontinence, no urinary stricture. <clears throat> Symptom improvement begins at two weeks post-procedure, significant improvement at four weeks. Peak benefit is at three months and remains persistent. Uh, right now, we are evaluating our five-year data. Expected outcomes, 90% success rate defined by 70% reduction in the IPSS score, which is pretty standard for TURP and HOLEP. 30 to 40 percent reduction in prostate volume at three months. Post procedure, post embolization syndrome, you know, including pain, nausea, vomiting, some burning, urgency, um, some rectal spasms. You know, uh, people can get some hematospermia, uh, penile ischemia. Uh, that's very, very, very rare. Uh, Balanite is extremely rare, but these are like you know the other ones are the expected complication. And uh, we give anti-inflammatory. <clears throat> We give antibiotics, we give peridium, vesicare, and Dulcolex for constipation. That's our standard regimen post-procedure. I'll quickly show a case, 62-year-old male with history of green light surgery four years back, uh, IPSS 28, QOL 6, Euroflow 3 ml per second, PVR of 170 cc, enormous prostate, 380 cc with a huge uh, median lobe, 
and obviously patient did not want to undergo a green light uh, or or you know his only option was really hole up or prostatectomy so he was referred to me for embolization we performed the embolization successful no issues at all and uh, 3 months later his prostate went down to half the size most of his median lobe was gone it was dead uh, and uh, at 3 months the ips score was 6 quality of life 0 post void residual down to 50 cc i just saw him for 2 years follow up no recurrence of symptoms <clears throat> so obvious indications for uh, intervention for bph uh, related lower urinary tract symptoms Uh, absolute remains urinary retention recurrent uti renal insufficiency and gross hematuria and that remains same for pae relative indications moderate pvr volume moderate to severe symptoms but pae specific men really wishing to avoid sexual side effects poor surgical candidates failed surgical procedures uh, large prostates more than 80 grams and and i can i can vouch on that that 75 to 80% of my practice is more than 80 grams Uh, hematuria uh, and urinary retention a lot of people come with urinary retention post hernia repair you know post uh, any other surgery mm-hmm. and they're just not not able to get out of retention when do we say no to pae very small prostate size less than 40 grams very large median lobe the case we saw was very large median lobe but he already had a green light before but if they come to me just with a extremely large median lobe with especially a figure of eight appearance then i stay away from it uh, predominantly irritative symptoms you know predominantly overactive bladder with no real uh, voiding symptoms very high post void residual with no symptoms which probably is pointing to an underactive uh, bladder um severe peripheral arterial disease with ct angio showing poor vascularization very rapid regrowth of prostate despite good initial response clinical outcomes as again you know you're, you're a group of urologists and you're aware 70% is what uh, terp gives us a 15 to 17 point reduction in the ips score quality of life 6 70% qmax improvement 125% and pvr reduction is around 77% with the very very uh, um a uh, very very impressive uh, low re- retreatment rate of 12% at 5 years and 15% at 10 years for a turp when it comes to the minimally invasive surgical therapies you know most of it is around 40 to 50% in terms of ips as reduction which uh, translates into 8 to 12 points except aqua ablation and qmax improvement by 50% so where are we with prostate embolization we look at the systemic review meta analysis of initial studies around 484 patients seven studies rather than going into micro detail the bottom line is 70% reduction in the international prostate symptom score <clears throat> and i think an important point here is uh, you know this early experience and the meta analysis was really spread over uh, a wide uh, variety of prostate volume uh, but having said that i think there is a, a strong preference now for using prostate embolization in especially large glands more than 80 grams uh, and that's where there is the widest adoption or the most uh, amount of adoption from our urology colleagues i mean i work with at least 30 plus urologists in south florida and all of them really send me more than 80 gram size uh, glands especially more than 100 grams uh, and i get a lot of referrals for hematuria urinary retention acute retention and so on so forth so on and so forth so again 17 point reduction in the ips score i'm i'm just in one slide i'm summarizing you know all the different studies which uh, were done in last 5 to 7 years which were comparative studies of pae versus uh, turp or any other randomized uh, trials and uh, most of those studies showed between 10 and 20 point reduction in the symptom score with 20 point being an exception um, but i would say it's more of 10 to 12 point reduction in the symptom score in most of the randomized controlled trials and most of them actually did not prove non inferiority Uh, to turp uh, and again the point i'm trying to make is that when it comes to smaller glands turp is the king you know less than 50 grams turp is the king 50 to 80 grams i would say the results will be comparative if we were only going to evaluate that subset but when it comes to larger glands more than 80 grams i think embolization 
is as good as uh, anything equivalent to TURP for larger than 80 grams, which is mainly a HOLEP uh, or an open prostatectomy. This is our experience, which we published uh, a couple of years back of 93 patients, more than 80 grams. And we saw uh, around 15 point reduction, 22.3 uh, down to 7.3 at 12 months, around 70%. <clears throat> but if we look at the prostate volume reduction, 40%, PSA reduction by 70%, post-void residual reduction by 70 or 69%, and QMAX improvement by 66%. And uh, how many patients uh, were IPSS more than 13 during follow-up remains around 15%. How many patients remain on medications or are able to get off medication? around 85%, so very similar to these numbers, around 15% of patients stay on medication after embolization. But another important thing is the IIEF-5. We actually saw an improvement in the IIEF-5 or the SHIM score after embolization at 12 months. And we just pr presented our, our long-term outcomes on the sexual side effects after PAE at Society of Men's Health uh, in United States and and we were actually awarded the, the best abstract. <clears throat> Rest of the adverse events are really expected. You know, dysuria, urinary frequency, urgency, small amount of hematuria, urge incontinence, fever, everything is expected and very minor and everything resolves within five days. <clears throat> this is a comparative uh, uh, um, outcome of all the larger than 80 grams compared to ours. And you can see that, you know, the variation is really um, between 50% improvement in the symptom score all the way to the 80%, but it's consistently around 65 to 70% and 12 to 16 points. A randomized clinical trial of prostate embolization versus a sham procedure was published in EAU uh, last year, which, uh, which definitely showed uh, that you know, PAE is not, not inferior uh, to sham um, and uh, showed you know, all the patients who received sham did not show any improvement. And after the blind period, uh, they were all treated with PAE and, and showed a significant drop in the IPSS score after they received uh, PAE in the open extension period. <clears throat> so very, very impressive outcomes again on PAE versus uh, sham and showing around 13 point uh, improvement uh, difference between PAE versus sham was 13 point uh, difference in the IPSS score. So PA showed 17 point improvement, SHAM showed only five point improvement. Still, there are some limitations in the data. Many of these are single center series and we do understand that and acknowledge that. Uh, we just uh, presented a series of 576 patients, uh, which is going to be presented uh, in, in next month at Society of Intervention Radiology. We understand many of these are uncontrolled and non-randomized. Um, we also understand that many of these studies report redundant data and there is some technical disparity, um, and there is some lack of standardization of outcomes as well. Uh, particle type, what's, what type of particle should be used, what size of particle should be used. Uh, nonetheless, a PAE does remain a very effective and very tolerable procedure uh, in, the, in, in the world uh, of like the entire paradigm of surgical therapy for BPH world. <clears throat> and there is definitely some very niche applications, you know, patients who are in acute retention, patients who have a recurrent hematuria, patients with a larger glands, patients who already had previous surgeries, patients who just do not want surgical procedure and who want to preserve, you know, sexual uh, function. Uh, those are all the patients who uh, do consider PAE as a first-line therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you really for the opportunity. Great, that's very interesting. It's very excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Batia. And uh, I think we will we'll, we'll ask some questions before going to the next speaker. Sure. Uh, I have just one question from the audience that it's about the size of the uh, particle use. Is it 500 or 700? Uh, no, no. Micro. 500 to 700 is actually too big. <clears throat> it yeah. should always be so less what's than the, the actual size of, of, of yeah. the particles. So we, we use uh, for small glands, we use 100 to 300. And for larger yeah. glands, we use 300 to 500. 
but i think you know for if someone is starting off i would say i would recommend just use 3 to 500 uh, of ambospheres i think that's the safest way to go because with the smaller particles the risk of non target embolization goes goes higher so i recommend 300 to 500 only okay so why why you privilege the the wrist rather than the groin in in your procedure so it seems that the route is very long going through the yeah, wrist so so we started using uh, uh, wrist uh, you know in 2016 and uh, we realized very quickly that it is very easy uh, to use the wrist mm -hmm. and it's actually much more favorable because you are going in the direction of the flow so you know going down into the internal iliac and going from one to the other side so in fact our procedure times reduced by almost 30 minutes uh, by switching mm -hmm. from groin to the wrist so going to the aorta going down to the iliac artery and That's correct. So we are bypassing the heart, right? We yeah. are going through the subclavian artery to the uh, aorta directly. So we yeah. are not going through the heart. So that's uh, okay, no, no, through, through. yeah. Yeah, this, through the the subclavian to the yes. aorta. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, what the you don't you don't need you never put a polycatheter post procedure. You say uh, so we do the, only if. No, we are, we do if like you know the patients do not want to undergo uh, the recovery they don't want like you know the burning they don't want all those things uh, and if the patients have a post void residual of more than 300 which by definition is chronic retention then i do not uh, i i prefer to use a foley catheter for 5 to 7 days okay uh can you do the redo this is a question from dr khiasi can we do the techniques a second time if if we feel the first uh yes you can so i think i i i'm i'm really conservative when it comes to that i do encourage always them to consider other options and i work very closely with all my urology colleagues and only if patients really want it to try second time i would but you know if someone got it like 7 years ago and now after 7 years they are having recurrence yes absolutely we can do reembolization so there should be some time delay between the first and second procedure yeah yeah i would be, yeah. i i don't do it like right away it's a minimal at least, 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 least two to at least 2 to 3 years 2 to 3 years yeah yeah uh is this uh, uh, actually the procedure now it's open to everyone i think there is no no contraindication I mean, i mean it's not we we privilege patient with comorbidities that that not fit for surgery yeah. and no, it can be done to anyone it can be done to anyone but again as i said i'm even after having such a large experience i'm still relatively very conservative when it comes to smaller glands i, I think I in the beginning you start with the yeah patient yeah. that are not uh, yeah very, I, mainly large yeah, glands not you know, like, for surgery and then you extend it to to a large population yes okay uh so this is a unilateral procedure you do one side only uh how you always, always be both. sure that that, uh, that all blood supply to the gland is interrupted and, uh, and it's you, you you do it only yeah no 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 we do both sides did you hear my question yes we always do both sides Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We so we really always good. always do both that's sides. Our our success rate of doing both sides is ninety. And uh, is there is any 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 issue with the any issue with renal function? Uh, yeah. Any with the compromising the renal uh, function if you if you do both and the procedure was very lengthy and uh, in, no. especially in frail patient with no, comorbidities so and Yeah so so that that is a very good question for actually Dr Kabli because he has pioneered you know doing this with carbon dioxide so he does not even use dye uh many times so he use a very small amount of dye iodine yes a very small amount so on an average we use less than ct scan the amount of iodine very small amount uh, less than routinely we use around 100 ml of iodine but we can do this with less than 20 ml of iodine both sides okay this is another question uh, i think you responded this through your presentation uh, 
the, the do you urologists refer patient to you oh 100% like yeah. uh, uh, 75% of my patients are sent to me by urologist and um, most of them in south florida so as i said i work with around 30 30 30 urologist at this point and i i perform around 200 to 300 procedures every year year okay so any major uh, complication secondary to this embolization like uh, hematuria or uh, uh, so um the prolonged major... retention or blood yeah. necrosis or anything that, that yeah yeah so so retention the, yeah yeah, yeah. The procedure yeah the risk of retention remains 1% 1% risk of retention yeah. 1% risk of uh, bad infection needing iv antibiotics and stuff but mm -hmm. you know they already have a history they have a history of recurrent utis so we kind of anticipate that you know we put them on strong antibiotic for 14 days and uh, no bladder necrosis no rectal we had uh, four and i think isam had one five cases of uh, a penile ulcer ulcer on the tip of the penis which uh, all of them okay. healed without any surgery all of them healed with the topical uh, lidocaine and topical steroid so what's the ideal scenario uh, the patient gets in the morning and we get the procedure we get discharged in the afternoon and yeah, so, uh, everything is yeah. all right <laughs> yeah so it's uh, so that's the, the usual outcome yeah it's 1:30 pm and i finished two already and they all both are home okay so do you have any special instruction Uh, if anything happened during the night host to call and what to do my cell my cell phone is open all the time all the time. <laughs> yeah That's i i don't like call. to bother my urology colleagues you know it's uh, that's not the way to build a practice of course yes so it's a very interesting presentation dr batia thank you very and much and thank you very much for this uh, no no it's my honor uh, Thank experience you. you had of this uh, condition so we'll move to dr raisam qabli and uh, we'll uh, listen to him regarding the, the, the experience of your center yes i saw it's up to you thank you thank you dr abul fadel and i uh, i hope you understand why i made sure to invite dr batia because he did all the heavy lifting yeah and the robo <laughs> yes, yeah, so give you a quick uh, background. I've uh, been working with Shivank uh, for the past more than 10 years. Extremely talented physician and he under his initiative we started the PAE program at the University of Miami about 7 years ago and uh, at that time I thought it was just going to be a, just another procedure so but it turned out to be a procedure that has a significant uh, steep learning curve because it requires a certain expertise and knowledge in terms of the anatomy and microcatheterization so what i'm going to be uh, sharing with you and hopefully also answer one of your question that you asked dr batia is the role is does pae cause hematuria or does pae is a significant adjunct therapy for you urologists in terms of hematuria so hematuria must be something that you encounter in your daily practice it's a common problem it is essentially associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia but also can be seen in various causes like cancer for example radiation therapy trauma uh, when left untreated it can be really a pesky situation it can cause significant and protracted problem for patients and when it does not resolve to conservative therapy then it becomes what we call the refractory hematuria which can be a serious condition and sometimes even life threatening so what i'm trying to share with you is the evaluation of uh, our single institution experience when we uh, evaluated pae in terms of safety and efficacy uh, for treating intractable hemorrhage of the lower urinary tract so essentially this is something that we're going to be presenting in the uh, sir next month uh, and uh, numbers keep changing so i'd like to invite you just to, to focus on the overall trend not at the detail of the the numbers that not all of them are uh, updated yet so work in progress so essentially it's 82 consecutive patient that we have been uh, treating and we 
uh, realized that hematuria presents in two different groups. We have either a group that comes to us with a refractory hematuria, this hemorrhage that is so serious that uh, usually these patients are admitted in the hospital, receiving therapy, receiving transfusion, et cetera. And there's another group of patients that uh, present with recurrent hematuria. This hematuria is a uh, lower intensity, but tends to recur over a long time, long period, and can be very difficult on the social life of those patients, not to mention that they may need uh, uh, protracted treatment. We looked at the endpoints uh, in terms of mainly resolution of the hematuria, but also uh, the improvement in blood requirements. And down the line, does PAE improve the cause, the underlying cause, like for example, BPH in terms of symptom improvements? So uh, the, the main cause in our series remained BPH uh, on these uh, patients, followed by either uh, cancer etiology with their invasive cancer in the bladder or the prostate. And other causes were also recorded. Some of our patients came to us straight from our urology colleagues, sometimes straight from the operating room where they were doing a TERP and they call us, hey, this patient have an intractable hemorrhage, can you help us? So we bring them, we do the PAE. And when we looked at those patients who had, uh, and we published on that, um, they had hematuria following urological instrumentation, we found that surprisingly a Foley, a simple thing like a place in a Foley can induce hemorrhage and sometimes very serious. Uh, followed by, by that was Foley removal. When I say by Foley removal, sometimes it's a traumatic Foley removal, a patient in the ICU, he doesn't know, he's not aware and may pull his Foley. And other causes were like as follows, TERP, nephroureteral placement, et cetera. The technique has been detailed by Dr. Batia, so uh, we use the same technique uh, for hematuria as we use for uh, treatment of BPH. Uh, initially, our practice was femoral, then we kind of moved all, almost all our procedure from a radial axis from the wrist. We use a selective embolization, bilateral, use the perfected technique, uh, we use the embospheres, and we use the coil embolization as uh, needed to prevent non-target embolization and to secure the procedure. So essentially the same technique is just the indication was PAE. We use of course cone beam CT, which is like a CT scan done during the procedure to tell us exactly where we are. This is a very important to secure the procedure. And we looked at the uh, several defined parameters in the study to see if we were efficient or not, like the early clinical success, how fast are we able to stop the bleeding, and were there any re-bleeding throughout the follow-up, and also we recorded the complication. The patient who were admitted in the hospital were followed based on either our own observation or the observation of the referring physician. Uh, we looked at their uh, laboratory values. We determined if they were uh, in need of uh, more uh, transfusion, et cetera. And when these patients were discharged, we will do a follow-up with them, with them according to a set protocol, usually at one month and three months, either with interventional radiology clinic or the urology clinic. So uh, this is our uh, kind of rough results, we have a high rate of technical success rate, uh, as well as an immediate clinical success rate. The time of resolution of hematuria in this patient was very rapid, 1.5 days in, in general. And when we say one day, it's really because we wait until the next day to go check on the patient. And that's why we say one day. In reality, those patients, uh, I'm gonna show you some case, may stop immediately bleeding on the table. And we had some case of recurrence and mainly the recurrence of bleeding happen in those patients who have advanced stage cancer disease. This is just kind of summarize a little bit the uh, clinical success in the two groups, as well as the resolution, sorry, uh, improvement, especially in the case of intractable hematuria, both in the hemoglobin level and the blood transfusion requirements. We also looked at their improvement in terms of prostate volume, uh, lower urinary tract, those patients were in retention. We looked at the volume reduction of the prostate and also the PSA, and there was improvement. Regarding the complication, most of the complications were self-limiting as it is the case in uh, PA in general. Uh, we didn't have any serious complication. This is just a chart to kind of summarize a little bit uh, 
the improvement, those patients who received BAE did not need to be transfused uh, as well. This chart shows a little bit of improvement on hemoglobin level post the procedure and decreased prostate volume. Now, when we do PAE <clears throat> for hematuria, you have to expect the unexpected. The reason being is like you're treating a patient who may come to you in a emergent situation, meaning we did not have time to work up this patient to see if he has inclusion exclusion criteria, et cetera. So this is a typical case. Patient come to us, intractable hemorrhage. This is undergoing uh, active uh, uh, bladder irrigation. He will need, uh, he needs, he's being transfused. This patient is difficult because this patient uh, is not your typical BPH patient. He is actively bleeding. He is uh, a little bit agitated. He has pain. He's, uh, evacuating clot from his bladder. He cannot uh, stay in an immobile position because this procedure is very precise. So we need the patient not to move during the procedure because we have the angiographic map, but still we were able to manage to treat him. This is the angiographic appearance. I'm showing here, this is the, uh, uh, this is the prostatic artery. This is the pedendal artery. So we do the, pro the procedure on both sides. This is the right prostate, left prostate. The comb beam CT show us the enhancement of the, the lobe of the left lobe of the prostate. And we uh, finish the procedure by treating the recurrent branch coming out of the IPA, which uh, uh, if we come back to the slide here, uh, you can see the urine clearing in the Foley catheter at the end of the procedure while the patient is on the table. Another case here of a patient who has uh, 80 year old, has so many comorbidities, he has myocardial injury, is on dual antiplatelets. He cannot have any uh, surgery. This is how we do the procedure from the wrist. Uh, this is the uh, Foley on the table before. At the end of the procedure, you can see the urine is already clearing. So, uh, and the patient was discharged home the next morning. So PA is very, really interesting in uh, those cases uh, who have uh, absolute contraindication to surgical procedure. This is how uh, his angiography looked like. And we have a super selective catheterization of the left lobe of the prostate. This is the equivalent on the Combeam CT showing enhancement of the, the, the left lobe. We do both lobes, we inject particles. So this technique is essentially the same. Uh, this is a CT scan prior the embolization. What I'm showing here is the uh, clot, the blood clot in the bladder. Uh, and during the follow-up CT showed also decreased size of his prostate gland. Another spectrum of patients that we treat are those who have uh, advanced cancer. So this patient come to us with a, uh, he's a physician, he had an advanced stage four prostate cancer, invading the bladder, invading the seminal vesicles. His problem was a long uh, chronic hematuria for many months requiring repeat blood transfusion. His problem was solved quickly with PAE. We were able to uh, do a selective embolization of his prostate. So when we do that, it's important to know the anatomy, know the variants. Uh, our group was the first one to publish about the uh, accessory pedendal artery and some of the variants that may be known to you guys, urologists, but uh, we uh, realized that our community of IR were really not you know, familiar with that. The knowledge has increased. This was early in the, in the experience. This is the accessory pedendal. Now we are much more familiar, as Dr. Batia said, in this case, it's accessory pedendal going straight to the penis. What we did here was put a coil to redirect all the flow uh, exclusively to the prostate and uh, the patient was treated with no problem. Uh, our group also has uh, published in terms of the coil embolization. This is a paper published by Dr. Batia a while ago so where we uh, use basically uh, coil uh, to protect the other territories to, to, provide, to, uh, to prevent complication, such as in this case, this is the, uh, the prostatic artery. We are in the left lobe of the prostate, but you can see a branch collateral going to the penis. So what we do here, we put a coil and all basically the blood flow will be just concentrated on the prostate. So the same concept can be performed for the bladder or the vesicle vessel, the penile vessel, but also the rectal vessel. So what is the challenge and limitation? Like I said, uh, in, when we treat in hematuria, we really don't have the luxury to select the patients. They come to us, they are on the table, they may be bleeding, but the problem, some of them may have atherosclerosis, peripheral vascular disease, whether this extreme tortuosity of the vessel 
or maybe also sometimes the preocclusive plaques can be a limitation. But we like to give the patient a chance, even in those extreme cases, and even sometimes, even, even if we do only one side, it can be beneficial to help those patients. Having the right armamentarium and tools is important. It's not just the physician. It's very, very important to have the tools to back you up when you do this procedure. So we have developed over time some preference. And we uh, now with the expertise, we know what microcatheter is the best in, in what situation. Uh, to answer your great question, Dr. Abulfadel, you, you, you asked about the, uh, uh, if there are any risk for the kidney function. This is a great question. Again, you have to realize that our group is a high volume and high experience. So with experience, we, lose, we use less contrast. Okay, so that's one thing. And the second thing, uh, we have been investigating uh, the uh, use of CO2 as an alternative uh, contrast media to iodinated contrast media. So CO2 is a gas that we breathe, that we make about 200 cc every minute, otherwise we die. So we can use it to image the vessel. So this is a case of a giant uh, prostate that was measured more than 700 cc that was treated exclusively with CO2. Both this is the uh, right prostate, this is the left prostate, and this is the, the gland. This is the so just is the empty pelvis, empty pelvis sign that Dr. Batia uh, spoke about. I'm just gonna skip for now. Uh, what about malignancy? Malignancy is uh, can be uh, treated in a very useful fashion, especially while well, those patients who have advanced stage disease, like in this case, who had both bladder and uh, prostate invasion. So we have been also our group investigating treating with the same technique, same material, cone beam CT, same particle. The key here is to be super selective and to target the, the mass that is causing the bleed. This patient had multiple, multiple problem. He came with advanced cancer, uh, compressing his veins, uh, causing obstructive uropathy and intractable hemorrhage. So in one session, we were able to uh, treat his veins. We can do thrombectomies, remove the clot, place a stent, obtained access in his kidney, we did the, the embolization, we placed the port. So uh, that's the, the main advantage of IR is the percutaneous. It can treat even these sick patients. What about the size? <clears throat> the size when it uh, comes to hematuria, the small prostate as well as the large prostate can make you bleed. So. Uh, yes, it's true. It's a little bit more difficult to do it in smaller prostate, but it is beneficial in our experience. So we treated here a small prostate, patient with prostate cancer, he has bone metastases. And on the other end uh, of the spectrum, we had we treated also what we call giant prostate. Uh, in this case, it's 700 cc's. What about bladder stone? Bladder stone was considered a, you know, an absolute contraindication to PAE. However, this patient was referred to us by his urologist. He wanted to shrink his prostate before doing a surgery on him, asystolitopaxi. Uh, we did the PAE for that purpose in preparation for surgery. The patient also was suffering from hematuria, uh, chronic hematuria. However, the patient called us 48 hours after the procedure because he was screaming on the phone. He was able to eliminate all, all his stones. And you can see, uh, his, uh, over the period of time, his uh, IPSS, shim, all improved and his prostate volume has shrunk. He had only one stone left for which was much easier to, to remove surgically after this procedure. Uh, our group published also uh, a review paper. We looked a little bit at the cause of the prostatic hematuria and we kind of hypothesized, and it's something that has been known in the urology literature since Dr. Foley. Uh, it, it seems that the, uh, there is an androgen uh, controlled growth factor that are responsible for angiogenesis, especially in the sub, uh, urethelial prostatic urethra, and that can explain why these patients tend to bleed when you put a Foley in or a Foley out. So they are particularly uh, vulnerable to that. And uh, <clears throat> if any one of you asks the question by curiosity, uh, do we see anything uh, different 
for patients who are actively bleeding during, because once you do like, for example, an angiography for, for a bleeder anywhere in the body, we have some signs. We can see extravasation. We can tell, okay, this patient is bleeding. Uh, we, we really don't see anything different, uh, even on the patient that are actively bleeding. We didn't see any active bleeder or extravasation. And that's why this is a more uh, a, a rationale in favor of uh, embolizing the whole gland, as opposed to try to selectively go after one single vessel. So uh, when we started the experience, there was not much described in the literature about PAE specifically to treat hematuria. All we had is older series that were basically, so embolization is not a new concept. It has been done since the 1980s, but at that time they were not doing PAE. They were doing non-selective embolization. They would just go and block the whole pelvic arteries. And not surprisingly, when you do that, uh, the less selective, you will have more risk of causing ischemia in the other organs, in the nerves, in the bladder, or you will have recurrence. So, however, when we do PA, we notice that not only we have much more efficacy, but the complication were much less. So now the, the groups, now this is just a review paper that we just published and we looked at what other groups are now starting to publish the experience using PAE in hematuria. And essentially, I'm not gonna go into detail. Their results mirror what our experience have shown that essentially uh, here in this chart, we can see from Dr. Ayagari, uh, in, uh, in the first row you see, here's a presenting gross hematuria in orange, uh, severe hematuria in 55 patient, and yellow is basically clear urine. So immediate control of the bleeding and the hemorrhage and a sustained result over time, over a period of 36 months. So again, from Dr. Tappin from the UK, they published about hyperplasia and cancer. Again, the same thing, a high rate of success, both clinical, lower complication, provided of course that uh, you have a physician that can do uh, this super selective work. So just to summarize, uh, Classically, this is a classic workflow of how a patient comes, is bleeding, and he presents for medical management. Initial recommendation will be to limit the physical activity, to avoid the mucosal laceration, do a continuous blood irrigation. And for the patient that don't respond, they may have to undergo or uh, receive blood transfusion. One uh, medication can be applied also to help those patients, either 5-alpha reductase, antiandrogen, or some medication to help with the, uh, the prothrombotic medication or luteinase and hormone release. If the patient responds, great, uh, we are done. If the patient does not respond, then we go to surgery. So what are the surgical alternatives that we have? I think you know them better than me uh, in terms of hematuria. Some patient may have to undergo TERP, fulguration of vessel, vaporization, uh, cystoscopic clot evacuation, Helmstein balloon compression. Some patient, they <coughs> may have to have irrigation uh, with alum solution, et cetera. And if hematuria persists, then we go to more uh, invasive surgery. So, uh, you know, our purpose is really to uh, convince our colleagues that uh, the utilities, which they are convinced here, our urologists in our institution, they know uh, that maybe PAE should be introduced uh, a little bit earlier in the paradigm of the treatment of this patient uh, with, uh, with hematuria. So I'm just gonna switch gear here, talk about the, our experience uh, in uh, patient with retention. I think Dr. Batia spoke about it, so I'm just gonna fly over it. So essentially just a study that we, uh, published regarding the utility of uh, PAE in patient who have retention and also have large prostate and have too many comorbidities to go to undergo surgery. So it's a single center series. I uh, looked at the efficacy and adverse effect. Um, 30 consecutive patient with a mean age of 73 years old who had uh, com associated comorbidities uh, precluding them for undergo to undergo surgery. Um, this is just a chart kind of summarizing a little bit uh, how they were doing, how many days they were in urinary retention, uh, their quality of life was not great, and the prostate were large, uh, 167 uh, mean prostate volume. 
So these patients after PAE were followed by both IR and neurology and uh, avoiding trials were performed within two weeks. If they failed, they were brought back after two weeks. So you can see that over time, some patient responded early, some patient uh, we had to do uh, avoiding trial until they were free of catheter. Both procedures were done uh, early, our practice from a femoral access and then uh, switched to transradial. Most of the patient had bilateral PAE and uh, about 6% of the patient had only unilateral PAE. And the clinical success was high, was 86% of the patient. For a uh, patient over 30 or 13% was still unable to void after PAE and remained dependent on the use of a urinary catheter. So you can see these patients have a mean age of 83 years old. They have a comorbidity index of seven. And uh, this chart just kind of summarized the whole data. So after PAE, all the markers, IPSS, quality of life, uh, the prostate volume shrinkage, the QMAX, et cetera, were improving over the period of the follow-up. The adverse event, most of them were grade one adverse events uh, that are self-resolving or resolved with conservative measure. And uh, grade two event were two patients with urosepsis. This is such patient, a patient in uh, with urinary retention, 71 year old uh, patient, he was not really satisfied with the situation. He has been performing CIC for 45 days, uh, had an indwelling catheter. Uh, so after the procedure, he was able to uh, get rid of this Foley catheter. His prostate volume decreased by 37% uh, from the baseline. So in conclusion, uh, uh, us interventional radiologists, we know what we can do with embolization. We have been doing embolization in the whole body to control hemorrhage. We intervene in trauma, we intervene in GI bleed, we intervene in gynecological hemorrhage, uh, portal vein, etc. <laughs> the only thing that we have not investigated is like using the PAE technique in hematuria. So we have used it in our series. It uh, has been proven to be safe, to be effective, to be highly effective in controlling uh, hematuria, but it goes beyond. It goes beyond treating just the hematuria because those patients who have been treated show, again, benefit in terms of improvement of their lower urinary tract symptoms, retention, et cetera. Uh, it also uh, can be effective in patients who have uh, urinary retention, large prostate, and they have too many comorbidities to go for surgery. Uh, we are revisiting the classical contraindication because we have been using more and more and expanding the, uh, the role of PAE. And of course, uh, multidisciplinary approach remains key. We work closely with our colleague urologists. Uh, they uh, absolutely uh, include in the PAE uh, in their paradigm uh, algorithm of treatment of, uh, of hematuria specifically. And, uh, Definitely, uh, as a service, we get involved early in the care of their patients. So thank you for your attention. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. I'm saying hello to all people from Agadir, uh, which is a city that I still have family in. And I, and I did spend my, I think, my childhood vacation in Agadir. I hope uh, you still have that beautiful beach. And it's a beautiful city. Thank you very much. You will be always welcome. That's very impressive. Uh, presentation and uh, it belies the experience and the expertise you have in this field. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I have just some very brief questions concerning the, uh, let's go first to the uh, CO2. Uh, did you use uh, CO2 in the gaseous nature or we, is it in another form like liquid or uh, you yeah. use like a, an air embolization of the, of the artery? Yeah, we use it in a gas form. It comes in yeah. a uh, containers. Uh, there are dedicated now um, small uh, delivery device that are made for uh, a small container, handheld, basically the size of a smartphone that you can use to inject. Yeah. There's another device coming on the market, mainly in Europe. We don't have it still in the US, not approved, that can actually regulate the flow and the rate of injection. So uh, it does not really cause embolism in uh, the arteries that we are uh, exploring. Of course, there are, there are some arteries where CO2 should not be used, okay? For example, anything above the diaphragm, we don't use CO2 because of the risk for the heart and the brain. But below diaphragm, it's actually better CO2 is a gas that diffuses very, very fast. 
That's why we are able to breed. Mm -hmm. If we could not diffuse, we will all die. So we use that property of diffusibility of the gas. It doesn't stay that much within the arteries. It diffuses very fast. And also it's more sensitive because the contrast is oily in nature. It's an oil, the contrast. So you need to inject more to see. The CO2, you don't have to inject that more, that much, especially if you have a bleeder, for example. So uh, our group were the first one to explore CO2 in the prostate. I think we, uh, we have presented in the SIR. There's a lot of interest. Uh, we, it's, we make it better by using some techniques, like, for example, balloon occlusion technique that allow us to see those branches better. So definitely the reason we started exploring CO2 because we did not want patient not benefiting from PAE because they had issues with their kidney. So this is, it's a way for us to expand the indications. So does it stay, how long does it stay in, 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 the, in the artery? It diffuses imme immediately. Yeah. As so soon as you inject it, it's it gone. Last in effect. Yeah, well, but uh, it, if it's gone, the, the artery is not occluded, or uh, what, what's the, how, how does it work? So our it machine doesn't stay. Our, yeah. our machines have specific protocols for CO2 and geography. Yeah. There's a specific timing to take the picture. So our goal is just to take the picture with CO2, not to keep the CO2, uh, you know, because it, it diffuses very fast. So we have specific protocol oh. that we use okay, in so our just for, for, for yeah, just for mapping. Just for mapping, yeah. Is it just for mapping, and then you you inject the the particles afterward? Yes, yes. Is that this is the yeah. Uh, one question regarding patient who, who come to you not through urologist but uh, didn't have workup for they have a high suspicion of prostate cancer didn't have the workup completed do you uh, work them up to before uh, electing them for PA that's a that's a great question uh, yes we do have patient that may self-refer themselves. They may have read anything on the internet or come sometimes from primary care physician. And then we do the workup, like for example, we do an MRI and we discover a cancer. Mm -hmm. In these cases, we don't treat them. We refer them, we send them to a urologist to get their appropriate care, okay? Uh, sometimes those patients have, are disappointed, but you know, we make sure that they get the appropriate treatment. I don't know if Shivank has uh, more input on that topic. Isam, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was responding to a text from a urologist. Which I have. <laughs> the question was, uh, if you receive a patient that come in self-referred and during your workup, you find that this patient has actually, on top of BPH, has cancer, do yeah. you go ahead, proceed to do the cancer uh, workup? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So, you know, we, we get uh, uh, MRI on most of our patients and if there is any suspicion of any type of malignancy, we will, um, um, the next step is to really get a, what, what is the new thing called 4K score. Uh, and once I get all the workup done, I work with my urology oncology colleague and uh, he reviews everything. And he will most likely end up doing MR ultrasound fusion biopsy. Um, and if the biopsy is negative, then he'll yeah. send back to me. If the biopsy is positive, then it goes on a different track. So, but the ratio is not, the rate is not very high. I would say like maybe three to 5% uh, at the max, you know, especially if we do MRIs, if we do more MRIs, because, you know, insurance does not authorize all the MRIs for BPH anyways. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and even for some cancer, maybe. Yes, so should, exactly. Some cases you have to have negative biopsy, then you can refer the yeah. patient. In US, maybe it's completely different from what is in Europe. Yeah. Uh, one of you, the challenge in you have you guys is the, the discovery of the anatomy on the table. So you have to discover some variant on the table. So uh, this is a, how how can you set up your table before? So what you need as a catheter, what a diameter, what kind. So you have everything ready by by the time you you, you have your mapping. Uh, right now, after you know doing a few hundred cases, I think uh, both of us have their go-to 
tools, the preferred tools. I think just like you surgeons, I mean, you probably have your preferred tools and material that you use. So, and I think, uh, you know, with those preferred tools that we have, uh, we are able to do approximately 90% of the cases. Uh, we do have backup special micro catheters, et cetera. We have so sophisticated micro catheters that can, we can steer, we can change the shape to engage yeah. those difficult arteries. These are exam very expensive. We don't use them all the time, uh, but we do, yeah, we do have all the tools and, and, and device. But at the end of the day, I think the skills of the physician are the most important, the knowledge yeah. of the anatomy. Um, and then, um, you know, what I what I use is probably a little bit different from what Shivank used, but at the end of the day, we are able to do the job with the, you know, some basic stuff. Some complementary things between the two teams. Absolutely, absolutely. Whenever yeah. I'm not able to get in, I call Isam. Whenever there is, uh, <laughs> yeah. it goes Isam. Whenever I have, you know, CO2 iodine problem, Isam. So you know, I can't I can't survive without him. Uh, this is the way to survive, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, another question uh, concerning patients with atherosclerosis where there is no, uh, no, no usual anatomy. So you will have multiple small artery, tortuous artery. So how can you deal with this? Isam, you want to take that? He does more, yeah. more of those than me. <laughs> okay, so in our group, I'm known to be the, the one, the unlucky one that get all of those. <laughs> Shivang, Shivang scrubs in, he finishes PA in 40 minutes. I have to suffer yeah. three hours. And he's very picky. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, 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 he's great. He's lucky. Yeah. So, um, no, that, I'm just joking. He's a he's an amazing, talented physician, and uh, his skills are like out of this world. So he's, he's really able to, to treat physician and i mean patients they say better be lucky than good so i'm, I'm lucky <laughs> no 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 i know i know you so uh, the problem of atherosclerosis is the main limitation of the procedure okay because as we need that arteries to be open to deliver treatment if the arteries are shut down some patient have total occlusion there's no arteries what can we do there's nothing that we can do if they are closed they have atherosclerosis some patients have difficult arteries, especially 70 plus, uh, smoker, diabetic, it can be very difficult to, uh, to manage. It's not like the young man, it's not like the woman, it's not like fibroid, this is different. So that can make it difficult. Uh, we have developed technique over time. We have developed some special tools, special wires, et cetera, that help us and we believe um, to give the chance to all patients. You know, our group does not exclude patients. Some groups, for example, Portugal, they would scan the patient. They do a CT scan. If they see he has atherosclerosis, they will tell him you're not a candidate. They simply would not start the procedure. Yeah. Uh, I think both of us, uh, we try to give the patient the best chance and fight for them. And sometimes you're surprised, even though bad arteries, you're able to go through and uh, deliver treatment. Uh, did it happen to you to have? Uh, sorry. Have See, right now, I'm I'm dealing uh, live with a patient. Sometimes uh, to have patient with uh, bleeding associated with coagulopathy, and this is uh, this is yeah. very helpful indeed. So, yes, yes, yeah. Of course, we yeah we deal with this patient. Uh, either they have active bleeding and they are, for example, on dual antiplatelet therapy due to a recent myocardial infarct, having a stent placement, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the uh, the fact that we are able to do it through the the radial access has uh, allowed us to push a little bit the the indication and decrease the risk of bleeding because uh, radial access is you can control the bleeding at the end with just one finger, as opposed to the growing. We can give you a uh, retroperitoneal hematoma that can be very difficult or life-threatening. In fact, I'm dealing with a patient right now who will get transferred this afternoon from 100 kilometers away, away from another hospital just to get PAE with us. Yeah, I think we covered everything. So you guys did an excellent job. That's very kind of you to accept our invitation. And we hope to see you soon 
in person in Morocco sometime. Thank you. This year. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really uh, appreciate it. We appreciate the invite. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll extend our thanks to Mr. Qadiri and uh, Cooper Pharma for covering this event. So thank you very much and have a good afternoon in US and good night for the rest of the world. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.